So, Monsieur, Rosine concluded, although you don't know me, you can clearly see there is no remedy for my troubles. I hope to end my torment through some fatal means which I shall reveal. The stranger responded, what if, instead of these fatal means, someone were to give you some sweet and pleasant way to settle these troubles? Wouldn't you feel obligated to this person, and wouldn't you do this person a favor in return? I'd do anything I could reasonably do, Rosanine answered with alacrity. With the exception of my honor, there is nothing I wouldn't sacrifice to show my gratitude. Since you do feel the way you do, the stranger replied, I should myself like to serve you, and with pleasure. But before I undertake this, let us agree upon the exact conditions. Now look at the wand I hold in my hand, and take it in your own hand. Rosanine took the wand he proffered and regarded it. It was quite small and made of unfamiliar gray brown wood, very bright. It was adorned by a changing stone that was neither ruby nor carnelian, nor any other stone known to her. In short, it was impossible to tell what stone was or the wood. After Rosany inspected the wand for some time, she returned to the stranger, who said to her, Look at this wand very carefully. It has remarkable powers. As soon as you touch it to flax and hemp, the wand will spin as much as you want every day, and of the finest quality. It has another feature. Touch wool, silk, or canvas, and it instantly produces tapestries more beautiful than any in the world, and the works of Petit Pont that are excellent in the best of manufacturers. I'll let you this marvelous wand for three months, provided you'll agree with the terms I'm about to offer you. If three months from today, three months to this very day, I return to retrieve my wand and you say, take it, Richten, Richten. Here is your wand. I'll take back my wand without being obligated to me in any way whatsoever. But if on the appointed day you cannot recall my name, you simply say, here, take back your wand, and I shall be master of destiny and leave you wherever I please, and you will feel obligated to follow me. Rose Annie took a few moments to respond. It seemed to her that it would be an easy to retain the name Rick Dindon, and that it would not be risky to accept the propitious help of the mysterious wand. She was already imagining secret delight in watching astonished faces of her vain opponents when she produced the beautiful spun yarn by the wand. However, she was troubled about one thing. She imagined that the artlessness with which she dressed herself and groomed would detract greatly from the advantages provided by her beauty. It would be a torment to stay in the place dressed and groomed unbecomingly. All these thoughts prevented her from responding to the stranger responding immediately. But finally she said to him, Monsieur Richten Richten, I shall accept your proposal if you will make one condition. Along with the virtue of producing beautiful yarn and tapestries, I would like your wand to be able to transform my coiffure and dress so that they will please everyone. If you enrich the properties of your wand, already so useful, as with a virtue necessary as beautiful women food, you can consider our agreement settled. Ah, exclaimed Richten Richten. Nothing is easier than to grant what you demand. My comrades and I never refuse the fair sex virtue of looking just that they would like. That goes without saying among us. It is why you see girls of twelve already capable of grooming themselves with remarkable skill and adjusting a beauty patch on themselves just as judiciously as a woman of fifty. Therefore I declare that as soon as my wand touches your coiffure and garments, they will have a first-rate appearance and flutter gracefully and they will entrance all the handsome young men. Then I accept your proposition, Rose Annie said. Ah, but you must swear an oath, Richten, Richten responded. Well, then I swear, she answered. You have my solemn word. That will do, said Richten, Richten. Now I have your promise in such good form, I'm your servant until we see each other again. Upon saying these words, he bestowed the wand on her and departed, 
The first thing Rosalie did was to touch the wand to her coiffure and clothes. Then she looked at herself in the nearest stream, and herself so beautiful and so well dressed, that she was immensely gratified. She concluded the agreement and remembered every detail. Her eyes caressed the obliging wand, and she told herself delightfully she had just acquired a very useful article at very little cost. Immersed in diverse thoughts, she walked through the wood and the park and returned to the palace. No sooner did she reach the entrance than she encountered the prince. Had he not seen her that day, but certain malicious jesters who overran the court had not failed to tell him about the clumsy manner in which the beautiful spinner had dressed and groomed herself. The prince had listened to everything without a smile. Indeed, he did not dare show them how much he was convinced Rosany was always charming, no matter what garment she wore, for he feared they would discover his feelings for the beautiful maiden. Seeing her now, he was as enchanted by her attractions as always, and upon examining her perfect appearance, he turned down one of those cold jesters who had exhausted him some hours ago with an instant story about Rose and me, and the man had believed to be very funny. The prince made a hundred remarks, both subtle and pointed, about the slanderous story. Then he greeted Rosany with such chivalry that it seemed as if she were one of the most distinguished people at court. He asked her graciously if he had seen the waterworks, and when Shushu responded no, he told her that he would have them played for her next day. Then Rosany made a low curtsy and withdrew to her apartment, still rejoicing in the marvelous wand though in her ecstasy she forgot the name of the man who had given it to her. That night, her joy prevented her from sleeping, just as sorrow had the first night that she spent in the palace. All during those hours that she should have been sleeping, her mind was occupied only by the idea that so was so pleasant, they made her more content than the most gratifying dreams could ever have done. In the morning, her wand was at her service instantly, as was Coquette, the most skillful of chambermaids, and her favorite. There she hastened to test the wand's powers on a small batch of the queen's flax, which, though the virtue of this enchanted stick of wood, immediately became a pound of yarn resembling the most beautiful yarn of Flanders. Overjoyed by the prowess of the wand, Rosany took some yarn to the queen that evening, to demonstrate that she was the most diligent worker in the world. Later, she watched the waterworks, which had been ordered by the prince, and they were better that day than they had been for a long time. When the day was over, she waited for the queen at the passage where she normally began her walk. And then the queen appeared, and Rosany told her that the cramps and rheumatism were gone, and she had spent the day working. Therefore, she had taken the liberty to come and show her what she had accomplished. The queen took the yarn and regarded it with eagerness. However, the sun had set, and the halls had been not been illuminated, so the queen ordered that the torches be lit at once. Once she could see, she was enchanted by the beauty of Rosanie's yarn, and enjoyed herself so, examining and praising it, that she forgot all about her nightly hour-long promenade. Finally, she remarked that she did not want any of her ladies at court to say anything against the beautiful spinner any more. To Rosanie, she said many gracious things and ordered her to come to her morning audience the next day. That night, Rosanie slept very well, and the next morning she did not fail to be in the queen's chamber on time, and she brought with her the other part of the pound of yarn that she had spun. Madame, she said to the queen, as she presented the yarn, since I saw that my little work had good fortune of pleasing you and could perhaps contribute to diverting you, I spent the night making something new for you, so you can see how zealous I am. Ah, poor child, exclaimed the queen, turning towards her lady of honor. She is just as affectionate as she is skilled and diligent. But my child, she addressed Rosany, I don't want you to make a habit of spending the night like this. It will ruin your health, which seems so solid and excellent. Madame, Rosany answered, it will be an honor for me to work for you, however much, and I shan't harm myself, 
if I have the good faith and strength of a girl of 17, and at that age there is nothing that can trouble me, I only beg you to be so kind as to permit me to entertain you for a few hours each day. If you grant me this, it will not cost me anything to spend the night working. The queen assured Rosany that if she did not stay awake the entire night, she would grant Rosany some time to entertain her each day. After receiving the queen's guarantee, Rosany answered, until I had shown you what I can do with the distaff and spindle, I daren't dare you tell you that I can weave a tapestry just as well as I can spin yarn. Now that you have seen a sample of my spinning, feel free to tell you that if you would like me to give you some wool, silk, and canvas, I'll weave all kinds of tapestries, and you can do some petit point for you as you wish. Truly, the queen exclaimed, this girl has prodigious talents. Go, my child, she continued. Go and gather strawberries in the garden and with my ladies. Later, I'll give you what you need to make tapestries and you can work on it tomorrow. Before I go, madam, I have another favor to ask you. Would you be so kind as to give orders that I am to be left alone and undisturbed while I'm at my apartment that you have given me? I cannot tolerate anyone watching me while I work and it upsets my concentration. Consider your request granted, the queen responded. You will be completely free and have your peace and quiet. When the conversation ended, Rosany withdrew and spent the rest of the day amusing herself, and that night she slept quite well, even though she had forgotten the name of the man who had given her the wand. She did not think about this much, and when she did ponder it, she was not unduly worried, for she was sure she would remember the name once she took the trouble to recall it. Besides, she had been given three months, and she wanted to profit from this all the time and use the one in peace. Inspired, indeed, these three months appeared to her just as long as half a century might appear to someone else. Meanwhile, the prince thought only about his love for her. The pleasure he had previously taken from her amusements was no longer so sweet. To go hunting or to feed her seemed inspid, and he was bored by everything at the court unless Rosany was present. She was the object of all his wishes, to see her and to talk about his tender feelings, and his prove his love to her by some great feat that would move her heart. He did not dare express these wishes as much as he was inclined to do, for fear that the people at court would notice this fervor. But despite the precautions he took, the old courtiers had largely discerned his true feelings. And this discovery contributed towards their showing Rosany a great deal of attention and consideration. As far as the young men were concerned, they did not have the slightest idea that the prince was attracted to this young beauty, and they mainly thought of her as the object of a pleasant conquest. The queen had ordered one of her ladies, named Vigilanti, to accompany Rosany everywhere. She went, and to serve as her mother. Vigilantine was delighted by this Simon. She found Rosany totally charming, and it gave her great pleasure to impart all she knew about polite manners and to extort the girl to conduct herself well in all the courtly proceedings. Since this woman had a good deal of intelligence and practical experience, she was able in a very short time to facilitate Rosany's cultivation. Now, in the capital city of King Prodom's realm, there was a public garden in which the beautiful ladies from the court and the city exhibited their attractions with great pomp. All the gallant young men displaced themselves to their best there too, and the coy young women suspended their ordinary judgments. The air was so hot and inflamed that not even the four winds could cool it. One ran the risk of becoming more intoxicated by all the flowery talk than by the flowers themselves. Vigilante did not take Rosany to the tempestuous place until she had instructed her on how to avoid all the dangers. Aside from Rosanine's good taste and gallant clothes, all accomplished with the help of the wand, Virgilante's lessons taught her to assume an immodest appearance, enhancing her natural charms in the radiant air so she appeared to be a remarkable person suited to inspire just as much respect as love. She was regarded with jealous eyes by four or five beautiful women who were a la mode and had come from the provinces to the capital with plans to find their fortune 
through tying the nuptial knot with some when well endowed young man. Relying on their attractive features, they imagined that they had merely to appear in this large city where the most cultivated, wealthy, most distinguished men of high rank lived, and these men would come running to offer them from their hearts and their hands in marriage. However, they had been erroneously informed that the men were moved more by two beautiful eyes than the lesser of gold. In vain they made a thousand efforts to advertise their charms with great fanfare. Hardly everyone thought of them in terms of solid matrimonial bond, and in spite of all the care they took, the only thing left for them was frivolous glory of being courted by foreigners obsessed with giddy creatures who were secretly bid by financiers. The only thing in their favor was that the public rendered justice to their virtue, being persuaded that they truly knew how to guard against the many different traps that had been set for them. Ordinarily, these beautiful women would have been divided among one another, but they found their united forces against Rosany. The flattery that she received from all sides, acclamations that she inspired when she appeared in public, made those other younger ladies extremely bitter. She could not tolerate some rustic villager having come and taken over the empire of beauty that each one of them had claimed as her own. At least now they desired to share it among themselves. Since then each of them had a following, their different supporters went to great lengths to decry Rosanie's charms in all their conversation. One found her nose too long. The other thought her mouth too large. Someone else said her eyes were lusterless and her complexion was too dark. They spread their stories with cleverness that those who had never seen Rosanie or who had only caught a glimpse of her were deceived by the pulse pictures. As a result, they began to say to each other that the queen's beautiful spinner, of whom the talk was of the entire city, was not such a marvelous beauty after all. On the contrary, she had many faults, and one should be cautious about expressing admiration for her. Yet despite all the trouble her opponents took to spread these notions, they evaporated as soon as Rosany appeared. Those people who had already seen her once regarded her now with more attention and found her more beautiful than before. Those who had only heard rumors about her recognized, once they saw her, that there had been a great deal of malice or bad taste in the pictures that had been painted. Vigilantine took Rosany to the theater, and the crowds that filled the vast edifice overwhelmed her with such loud applause that she was embarrassed about it and ever upset. To be sure, she was not angry about people admiring her, but she was no different than most beautiful women, desirous as they are of praise. However, Vigilantine had told her that nothing was more fatal for a young woman than to be noticed too much, and since people regarded her too much, Vigilantine decided that it would be best not to go on public walks or to the theater that often. This saddened Rosany because she enjoyed those places where were so many stimulating things to see. However, she soon had something to console her for this minor disappointment, and it was due to this fortunate success of her wand. Even though she spent the day largely amusing herself and taking walks, she always found them to have obliging wand do the tasks of a worker beyond others. Then she continued to show how the most beautiful yarn in the world to the queen, when eight or ten days passed after she had given wool, silk, and canvas, she produced tapestry that was more beautiful and better made than that of Arachne. The queen, whose passion for such a work was sometimes a bit extreme, was ecstatic when she saw Rosanie's tapestry. She bestowed on her great praise with numerous caresses, and from that day the beautiful girl was overwhelmed by gestures and signs of favor. It seemed that one even forgot that she came of a lowborn family, that she was in place with the maids, of honor at the most courtly celebrations, and was indeed considered to be among the most distinguished of them. These young ladies were very much irritated by this, except for one whose name was Serene, and the young woman had pleasant face and a generous soul. She paid tribute to Rosaline's beauty and skills, and instead of scorning her low birth, 
She said that one should give her more credit than would a person born into an illustrious family who was not obliged to cultivate notable sentiments and conducts. It was partly because of this, and not just because the young lady had such a beautiful voice and sang so pleasantly, that she had acquired her name. Moreover, the people at court deemed her temperament just as sweet as her voice. Rosany, who sensed Serene's favorable disposition toward her, developed true feelings of friendship in return. Serene was always gracious and obliging and acted this way out of inclination and joy, while her companions did so out of politics with vexation. Not only were they ashamed and obliged to behave so courteously to Rosany, but as I have already said, they were annoyed by the distinguished honors and lavish praise she received. The prince was delighted by his consideration and the people at court were giving to his beloved. And then, sometime dismayed by the difficulty he encountered in revealing his tender feelings to her, he had succeeded in managing to see her often and could not complain about this. However, he was not able to get himself and converse with her for a single moment. Nor was he having those who permitted to enter her apartment, and whenever she left it, Vigilantine was at her side. Furthermore, he had organized some balls in vain. Ordinarily, one can find a way to speak to the woman one loves at a ball, but Rosanie did not know how to dance. Although she had been given a dancing master as soon as she had arrived at the palace, she had barely had enough lessons to achieve a good curtsy. At balls, therefore, she was obliged to be a spectator among a group of others, affording him no suitable occasion to disclose his feelings toward her. To be sure, the prince had sought to make her understand his sentiments through a thousand gallant acts and diverse hints whenever he spoke. And to be sure, he had overheard a hundred small things she had said, but that she would herself kill herself as soon as she realized he heard them. But it was not enough for a love as passionate as him to be known that by which he had aroused in her. He wanted to ascertain for sure whether he had made some favorable impression on her heart. He saw with great resentment that many of the men of the court and city had already dared to declare their feelings in front of Rosany and right under the eyes of Vigilantine. He even knew that an ambassador, forgetting the dignity of his position, had been so bold as to want to tempt her virtue by offering a prodigious sum of money to be his mistress. Of course, this was extremely disturbing for the beautiful maiden, who had already cultivated nothing but noble and elevated feelings. Aside from this, she was very much a child in her inclinations and pleasures. She had boundless love for ribbons, dogs, and birds. Whenever the ladies had a serious conversation, she would become impatient, and in a very short time, she would amuse herself with the best girls her own age. If she loved to play at the theater, it was not so much for the play itself, but because she enjoyed seeing a large group of people bustling together in one spot. The poor girl understood very little of the satirical lines in a comedy, and even less of the political illusions and the tender poetry of a tragedy. And if it were not for the pleasure of being seen, she would have preferred to amuse herself by playing blind man's bluff, bagatelle, rather than attend the theater to see such plays as Cena, Iphigenia, or the misanthrope. Despite these childish inclinations, however, as well as her natural tendencies and affections, she did not succumb to the art of prince. Her penchant for virtue set in opposition to her own feelings for so amiable a lover. She continually told herself that his elevated rank compelled her to close her eyes towards love and accomplishments, since his rank was an invincible obstacle to their ever being united in a sacred bond. So the beautiful Rosany continued to use the wand in glorious spinning and weaving, as well as adorning her own graceful and fine appearance by the admiration of all. And she succeeded in learning to dance very well, and even without the benefit of magic. Indeed, she had no other advantage here other than a good dancing master. On the other hand, despite same benefits, her progress was in reading and writing was weak. She found forming letters and tracing their characters boring, and lacked the strength to apply herself to something that did not divert her. 
The prince still burned with impatience to reveal his feelings to Rosany, if only for a few moments. The way he was forced to restrain himself put him into a bad mood. Now, among the more assiduous young men at court, there was very bright chevalier by the name of Bonavis. Hmm. Which reminds me, it's time to check if the camera's on. Oh, I really hope it's on. Hello, camera. Are you on? 25.47. So I assume you're going to click when it's time. The prince was delighted by consideration the people at court were giving to his beloved. Yet, even at the same time, he was dismayed. The prince burned with impatience to reveal his feelings to Rosalie, if only for a few moments. The way he was forced to restrain himself put him in a bad mood. Now, among the more assiduous men at court, there were a very bright chevalier by the name of Bonavis, who had been endowed with many fine qualities. To him, the prince confided his longings. And Bonavis, who was ingenious, quickly found a means to help him. He accompanied his lord wherever he went, and thus, when the prince encountered Rosany, Bonavis cleverly managed to occupy Vigilantine in conversation about a matter that seemed of great importance to her. The prince, free to talk to Rosany about his love, drew such moving and tender pictures that she was quite touched. But such was the sensitivity of this beautiful young woman that she told him he must extinguish his ardor, since, despite all the accomplishments, she would never stoop so low as to become his mistress. And, clearly, she had not been born high enough to become his wife. The prince responded that it was not a novelty for kings to marry a villager. Nobody would see anything strange in a bond of love and merit. Though Rosaline did not understand the figurative manner of speaking customary in the theater, she grasped that these words perfectly well because they emanated from the mouth of a lover whom she cherished. The prince assured her that he loved her more ardently than anyone ever loved before. He solemnly declared that he would rather renounce his claim to the throne than give her up. He swore oath upon oath that no matter what might happen, he would never marry anyone but her. And he was making the same solemn vow he would naturally, in the manner that Rosany let herself be convinced that his love was sincere and pure, and gave him permission to talk of her about from time to time, provided that he kept his promise regarding respect and loyalty. The amorous prince swore to her again that he would never think about pleasing anyone except her, and that he had feelings only for her, and that he swore all of this with the most binding of oaths. After that day, when the hearts of the two lovers had reached an understanding, their eyes were in perfect agreement too, and they often gave tender signs of the secret feeling. Bonavis knew how to arrange for diverse conversations to take place, but he was not always able to succeed with such skill in covering up the prince's attachment to Rosany. Therefore, the king and queen were forewarned. Since the king regarded his son's inclination as a passing fancy, and the queen she had much more confidence in Rosaline's virtue, that she didn't harbor the slightest fear that their attachment would be fatal. The prince made every effort to conceal his love from the eyes of the court, but love is one of those turbulent things that can be concealed only under the veil of discretion, and even then only rarely. As soon as Rosaline's opponents had been informed about her illustrious conquest, their jealousy and hate doubled. Among these young women, who let themselves be swayed by such unjust feelings, none was more tyrannized than one of the queen's handmaidens, who had been secretly in love with the prince for a long time. This Pensemon was somewhat of a beauty and greatly ambitious, had a violent penchant for love and a dark soul. Furthermore, she was vindictive as she was crafty. As long as she saw that the prince was indifferent towards all the beautiful women at court, she consoled her